This is where we think about how you merge science with nutrition and the idea of trying to protect the world against climate change. Where are you on the spectrum here? How do we think about nutrition and food and the environmental footprint? Yeah, well, let, let me start to say that I think it's really important to realize that, in fact, uh, we have to end poverty, you know, and, and, you know, by ending poverty, it means, in fact, that, of course, many of the low and middle income countries need to improve their economic gr growth. No, that's, that's critical. And as part of that, I think, that, but, you know, one of the main obstacles which has been recognized by the World Bank is, in fact, that many of the low middle income countries have a high prevalence of undernutrition and particularly under nutrition, which started in the first 1,000 days, because actually that will influence, in fact, your brain development as well as in the longer term, you know, your obesity and chronic diseases. So to tackle that problem, they have realized that we need to prevent what we call stunting, you know, what happens in the first 1,000 days. And to do that well, in fact, children need to have the most optimal nutrition. And it means, in fact, animal source food like, you know, eggs and milk. Well, at the same time, of course, we have the climate problem. Mm -hmm. And, you know, many research papers have recognized in the past two years that, in fact, agriculture is actually, a, you know, a main contributor to the greenhouse gas emissions. You know, many people know about, of course, the uh, energy sector, but not many people understand, in fact, that the uh, agriculture is also very critical. And yes. so recently we had in, uh, in January a very important paper came out by the EAT, uh, Lancet Commission, and they showed a really great sustainable diet, you know, which was in the, within the planetary boundaries, and with a big focus on the prevention of uh, obesity and chronic diseases. And of course, if the world would shift to that particular diet, we would have millions of people who would be, you know, not dying from, in fact, these chronic diseases. But what actually was missing in that paper was looking into what it me meant in the context of the whole world, like at country level. So I think, the, you know, at Johns Hopkins we did this research looking into nine planned forward diets in the context of 140 countries. And of course, the results were really remarkable. So, Doctor, what kind of solutions have you managed to come up with? I mean, is the answer to ask certain countries to do less when it comes to agriculture production or protein type production so that developing countries can have more than their allocation? Is, is it some kind of, you know, balanced approach globally? Do we all need to work together as a globe for this? Well, it's absolutely the case. Like, you know, like you look at what the impact, you know, at, at least the, the data clearly showed, what also the Lancet showed, is that in, in countries like uh, North America, Canada, you know, Latin America, Europe, we definitely have very high greenhouse gas emissions because of our agriculture production and consumption. And we should reduce that to a much more healthier diet. And automatically, of course, uh, we would reduce, in fact, our emissions. But the situation is a bit, a bit different in the low and middle income, income countries. Just for those countries to actually give the options to their population to, you know, provide them with a, a healthy diet, that means, in fact, that they will increase their uh, greenhouse gas emissions because the current production as well as the trade is not actually enough to provide them with the right uh, options. And I think so that's why, in fact, we have to look at it from a global perspective because the whole food system is, of course, interdependent. Yes.